Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. We are so excited that you are joining us for the show today. This podcast aims to explore a biblical life view in a conversational tone. Let's join our host and founder of Servants of Grace, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Lexum Press. Visit the Lexum Press website to receive 30% off of Kevin Van Hooser's latest, Heroes and Doers, a book we'll be having a conversation about on today's podcast. To purchase your copy, simply go to lexumpress.com slash Van Hooser to order your copy for 30% off today. Welcome back to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave and I'm the host for this podcast. And today I have with me Dr. Kevin Van Hooser. Dr. Van Hooser, welcome to the Equipping You you and Grace podcast. Thank you for having me in. You're welcome. Well, can you uh, tell us about your life, marriage, ministry, and s- some of your upcoming ministry writing projects? I can. How much time do we have? Um, wh- however much you want to share about with us. I'll give you. I'll give you a medium elevator speech. How's that? Cool. So I am a native Californian. I went to Westmont College in my hometown of Santa Barbara, and after college, I had a ministry opportunity to go to France to use classical music for the sake of missions and evangelism. I'm an amateur pianist, so I thought this is fantastic. And I went and organized a series of concerts throughout the country using music and the theme of joy to bear a Christian witness. Uh, Briefly, the idea was this music is joyful, and we Christian musicians believe that there is a basis in reality for our joy. And that led us to a non-gimmicky presentation of the gospel. Anyway, during my year there doing missions, I met my wife, who is French, and so we've been married for over 30 years. And uh, after Westmont, and after getting married, I went to Westminster Seminary, and then on to Cambridge, England, for doctoral studies. And... uh, all told, between living in Cambridge and then teaching at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland for eight years, uh, we lived in the UK, either England or Scotland, for a total of 12 years. Hmm. So I was teaching theology at the University of Edinburgh, and my full-time job, what I'm doing now, and what I've done off and on since 1986, actually, is teach systematic theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. So we're now, uh, we've been for the past couple decades, coming to appreciate the plains and the Midwest and all the flora and fauna that's part of Midwest. So I've been teaching systematic theology. I supervise 14 PhD students which I think is pretty good. It's two more than Jesus. Not that he had PhD students, but, you know, disciples. Mm -hmm. That keeps me busy. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you consider writing books a form of ministry, and I do, I'm also working on a book on biblical interpretation. So those are that's what I'm up to these days. Oh, wonderful. I know that you've written quite a bit on, on that subject of biblical interpretation. Is there, uh, is there meaning in a, te- in a text, I think is the one of the titles? Yes, and the answer is yes. Yes, yes. And and several others, uh, the pastor is theologian with Owen. Yeah, you write very well and helpfully, so I, I appreciate that. So. Thanks. Thank you. Well, can you uh, tell us about this book that you've written, Hearers and Doers, A Pastor's Guide to Making Disciples Through Scripture and Doctrine? Why did you write it, and how is it being received? Yeah, so pretty early on, as I after my doctoral studies, I came to have a kind of policy that for every academic book I'd write, I'd write a book explicitly for the church. It just seemed to me that a theologian ought to have a foot in both the church and the academy, and the church really being the, the more important location. So I, I tried to keep up with that, and this book is one of those that I've written explicitly for the church. It has a fairly unique perspective production history among my writings because I never planned to write this book. It actually started as a video course for Faith Life Media, a Mm -hmm. course I did that was called A Path and Place for Making Disciples. Uh, And then after the course, they asked me to think about publishing it, but I had a look at my notes and I decided I needed to do more with this. It just didn't meet my standards as, you know, what what should go into a written book. And some of the things I had said before, and anyway, I, in the process, of revising it, I ended up adding about 60% new material and an entirely different theme and a different focus. So I've been explaining this by saying I reverse engineered it. It started off as a course and then 
through this process of reverse engineering, I came up with a book, and I am finally uh, happy with the final result. Um, it's really about the importance of making disciples fit, and not simply fit in the physical sense, but fit for purpose. That's why I wrote it. I, I believe that it's important that the church should be in the business of making disciples fit for purpose. And I also wrote it because I think a picture holds a large swaths of the North American church captive, and that picture is of non-discipleship Christianity. I think there's a picture out there that's dangerous of non-discipleship Christianity, as if such a thing existed. Um, as to how it's being received, well, it's very early days. I think we're just maybe five months after its release, so it's still, you know, learning to walk as a toddler. But uh, for a while there, I did see that it was the number one new release in the discipleship category at Amazon.com. That's about as far as I know, as far as its release. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've I've seen uh, quite a bit of chatter about it, uh, just just in some circles on the internet. Been encouraged by that, and I was like, well, I gotta check this out. When I saw it, I very much enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. Um, you you said something pretty interesting there when you were talking about why you wrote the book. What 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 concerns you about non-committal discipleship? Uh, it's not non-committal discipleship. It's non-discipleship Christianity. Non that is the idea that you can be a Christian without being a Christ follower, I think is a dangerous idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a lot of people who say, when I lived in Idaho and I was studying seminary, well, I go to church, but uh, where do you go to church at? I go to church uh, over there in the corner um, for yeah. my Bible study, and and uh, we know that's not that's not a church. Yeah, well, I think people, you know, there's just a misleading picture of what it is to be a Christian, and part of what I try to do in the book is suggest that let's make, let's let Jesus define what it means to be a Christian. And so that's the that's uh, the gist behind the title, Hearers and Doers. You know, he doesn't want just people to be hearers. He doesn't want followers who are simply admirers or fans or people who say they like Jesus. <laughs> he wants people to be doers. That is, he wants people to put his words into practice. And that means you actually have to follow Jesus, and you have to follow Jesus in a more robust sense than you follow the Yankees or the Cubs or some other team. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Well, throughout this book, you, you talk about the theological interpretation of Scripture. Can you briefly help us understand what the what this is, the theological interpretation of, of Scripture for our listeners who might not be familiar with that term, and how biblical and th theological interpretation are both similar and different from one another? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. You're asking long questions. I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> uh, but it, it does, it, this is a long question because it, it involves involves a long story, um, you know, centuries long, but, but here's the really short version. Uh, lots of people have recognized that in the 17th and 18th centuries, roughly, a fateful shift took place. Uh, I would call it a Copernican revolution, just a switching of the pictures. You know, in Copernicus, he was the one who said, hey, the earth revolves around the sun, not the sun around around the earth. He just completely switched the pictures. And I think something as drastic as that happened in the 17th, 18th centuries uh, with regard to biblical interpretation. And it's this. Instead of the Bible being the framework used to understand the world, the world, and secular history in particular, became the framework for reading the Bible. Mm. You see that how that switches things around. Instead of the world, the, instead of the God's word being the lens through which to look at history, history became the lens through which one began to study the Bible. Mm. And Michael Legaspi has a book that he's written about this. It's called The Death of Scripture and mm. the Rise of Biblical Studies. Mm. And he has this um, phrase that he calls the Academy's Bible. You see, instead of the book scripture uh, leading the church, the academy began to study this Bible by reconstructing um, historical context and really this is the age of criticism where one began to be suspicious about the text. It may have appeared to be written by Moses, but if we study history, we know better. Anyway, the, again, the short story is in biblical studies, academic biblical studies, the original historical context has become the privileged context and the goal of reading scripture is a scholarly goal of recovering the original author's intention. Hmm. And so what was changed then is the goal of reading the Bible to hear God's word. So when I use 
phrase theological interpretation of scripture. I have in mind reading the Bible with an ear and for hearing God's living and active word. So what was lost in this modern switch, this shift of paradigm, was the canonical context and the broader redemptive historical context of scripture and the historical, the original historical context became the privileged context. So theological interpretation of scripture is reading the Bible to learn about God, to hear the word of God, and to edify the people of God. That's really good. So so basically it was, um, like you were saying, they, they were more interested in the history surrounding things than the text itself, essentially. I it, think so, because, um, you know, in, in the modernity, there was this suspicion that the Bible isn't what it appears to be. It appears to be God's word, but the critical mind, you know, suspects that that appearance may not be true. So this was the period where people tried to reconstruct the history behind the Bible instead of simply taking the Bible's word for it. And that's a paradigm shift. That's what I'm calling a Copernican revolution. Yeah, definitely. That makes that makes good sense. In what way does theology serve the church because doctrine serves discipleship along with biblical interpretation when done the right way. Yeah, that it follows up from what we've just been talking about. Look, I uh, I have taught in a secular university in the University of Edinburgh. I believe in higher theological education, but I also understand that theology isn't what it used to be because there was a time before theology was a university discipline. In fact, in the medieval era, the universities emerged from churches. Hmm. In fact, you see the birth of the universities stem from people coming to a church to study how to read the Bible with a master. And that's when theology was born, in a sense. It was done in and for and by the church. And originally, theology was done for a very practical purpose. It was done to help mature disciples, uh, to help people grow in the knowledge of God. So I think that's, I think we need to recover theology's original purpose, which is, again, is about building up disciples. And then, and then theology also helps us read the Bible better. And that also is for the sake of building up disciples. So I see theology essentially as a ministry, a special kind of ministry, because what it ministers is understanding. The understanding of God and God's Word, the understanding of the story of the Bible, and all the doctrines that we teach, they really, they're, when it comes right down to it, the doctrines serve the story of Scripture. They either help us to understand what's going on in the story, or they answer a question that we might have about the biblical story, such as, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus, the Son of God, or why did the Son of God have to take on a human form? Why did why did these things happen in the story? And theology really is all about coming to read the Bible with a fuller understanding. Yeah, that's really good. And I especially appreciate your emphasis on community, reading the Bible in, in community there at the beginning. That's uh, uh, yeah. So, so Be- important. Yeah, because I think um, when we come to understand God and the world and ourselves uh, through the lens of Scripture, we see that the world is here and the church is here and that we are here because God is involved in a building project. He is trying to build a holy nation, um, a people for himself to be his treasured possession. And so it, that's what God is up to. I, as a theologian who is trying to serve the purposes of God, I also have to do theology in a way that builds up this community. That's really good. How can church leaders make disciples by better enabling them to critically examine and examine images and stories in light of the biblical images and stories by which they ought to live in? Yeah, again, that follows what we've just been talking about. If theology helps people read the story of the Bible better, then uh, to become a mature disciple means using the biblical story as the lens through which you read everything, including your own culture. And by the way, that's what I try actually to do in my book, Hearers and Doers. I I have to perform this negative prophetic task of casting down idols. And I call out some of the idols in our society, these pictures or these images that have captured people's imagination to a story other than the gospel. So I do think that church leaders make disciples in part when they help people to become culturally literate, when they help people to read their culture and find out what's actually going on or why things are, you know, trending in our society. What does it mean? So, for example, in my book, I call out the fall 
cults, gospels of health and wellness that occupy and preoccupy the social imaginary, if I can use that technical term, of American society. Yeah, I think that's really, uh, really interesting that you're talking about uh, the prosperity gospel. Um, the episode that's going to come after this is I'm interviewing Kasi Hinn, Benny Hinn's nephew, and uh, oh. he's got a really good book called God, Greed, and it's it's really helpful where he details, you know, that his story coming out of the prosperity gospel, how he got saved, and they, they use uh, the same terms, um, but they mean different things, kind of like the Mormons do, and, and yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and those kind of things. And so I, think, so I, was, I was talking about prosperity gospel in part, but I'm also talking about an image that has grabbed the imagination of people who don't even think, well, who aren't even Christians, but they've made a religion, as it were, out of things like health and wellness, and one of the things I think we need to do to understand society is we have to follow the money. Where are people investing their time, their energy, and their money? And in my research for the book, I was stunned by how many people are investing in a pursuit, not of happiness per se, but of wellness. Wellness is a really interesting concept, and I think it's, it has a kind of religious aura to me, as, as far as I can understand in our society. Wellness, there's something called the Global Institute of Wellness. They they speak about wellness as if it were a kind of salvation. So that's why I'm saying, yes, there is the prosperity gospel, but there's also a discourse about wellness that speaks about it in quasi-religious terms. And a lot of people, even people who say they aren't religious, they have a religious life devotion to the pursuit of health and wellness. And uh, that was one of the main contrasts I tried to highlight in my book. On the one hand, you've got people obsessed with physical fitness and wellness, and yet in the church, the body of Christ, you have a conspicuous lack of concern for the wellness and fitness of that body. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And and I can say growing up in Seattle, I, I saw that firsthand, you know, this, this emphasis on oh, well wellness and yoga and all, all sorts of new age practices as well. And, if I could uh, just, uh, if I could, uh, it's interesting you saw it in Seattle. I think it everywhere. I was surprised this summer to pick up uh, the latest edition of the Chicago Botanic Garden newsletter. And there are a lot of things happen in a botanic garden, but what caught my eye was a series of courses that are being offered this summer on yoga and mindfulness in nature. And I thought, oh no, now the Chicago Botanic Garden is getting into this pursuit of mindfulness and wellness in a quasi, you know, spiritualistic way. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I I just saw it like in the '90s, in the early 2000s in Seattle. Oftentimes, things in Seattle it seems to go you know all over from there, and and so I um, have seen it. It's in LA. I mean, you're right. It's it's everywhere. So you write about the pastor as an eye doctor and general practitioner of the church. Can you briefly flesh out this idea for us and how it relates to uh, your other work on being a pastor theologian? Yeah. So let me explain because that my theme is if it comes out of field to call the pastor an eye doctor. What I have in mind by that metaphor is uh, Paul's phrase in Ephesians 1.18, where he speaks of having the eyes of your heart enlightened. And I've read a number of things that um, have convinced me that the eyes of the heart might be a biblical way of talking about what, what I mean by the imagination. So to call the pastor an eye doctor is referring to the importance uh, of a pastor's caring for the imagination of his congregants, or what Charles Taylor calls the social imaginary, which is the picture that sort of runs our life, or the picture that we run our life by. And then, as far as the pastor being a general practitioner of the church, a GP, that's a, a reference to the church as the body of Christ. So, yeah, the pastor is to be concerned for the health of the body of Christ. And then I would want to connect that, the pastor being the general practitioner, to the idea in the pastoral epistles that doctrine is itself sound, and the Greek term for that word sound uh, is the term from which we get our English word hygiene, and it really means health-giving doctrine, and that's why I call the pastor a general practitioner of the church. In teaching doctrine, the pastor is giving health-giving material to the body of Christ. Mm. So when 
the, the pastor doctors the body of Christ when the pastor teaches sound doctrine. And I believe sound doctrine is the antidote to all the toxins that poison the church's imagination and uh, sap it of spiritual strength. Well, we definitely, I, I love that imagery and your explanation is, is, is excellent. We do need, uh, we do need pastors to, to preach. This is why we need, a, a, I would argue, expository preaching is the best way to, to accomplish this. Yeah, and let me just add, I think you're right. Let me just add that uh, what's also interesting is that in our society, we really value medical doctors. We pay them a lot. We respect their opinion. Doctors of the church, not so much. Mm -hmm. But I, I do believe that, you know, that's a, it's unfortunate there's a disparity because I really do believe that pastors have something to offer and they should never say, I'm just a pastor. No, a pastor is a doctor of the church. There's something that the pastor has to offer that is precious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what would you, what would you say to pastors that may be thinking, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just preaching the word and um, I, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of being a doctor. I'm providing sound uh, biblical doctrine um, to them and to the to the church. That's that's maybe not going as well as I, I would want. Uh, maybe you could just encourage them for just a minute. Well, first of all, never say I'm just preaching the word. <laughs> Preaching the word is, is a huge privilege and responsibility, and that also is closely related to doctoring the church. I mean, teaching the word, preaching the word, expositing it, that is the way to get scripture into the bloodstream of the church. So you're doing something very, very important. Um, and the other thing to say, just to encourage pastors, is you're, you're doing the Lord's work. The risen Christ, according to Ephesians 4, gave the church pastors and teachers for the sake of edifying the whole body. So you're on the front line. Society may not value the role of the pastor as much as it has in the past, in the medieval era and so on, or even the 19th century for that matter. But uh, don't care about what people think about you. Look to the scriptures and be assured that you are doing God's work. Mm, that's really well said. What distinguishes the biblically disciplined imagination from the non-disciplined imagination? Good question. Let me, let me preface it, my answer, though, by just saying a little bit about what I think the imagination is because uh, lots of people when they hear the word imagination they think about their King James Bible translation where every time you read the English word imagination it's prefaced by the term vain or empty and I understand that a lot of people think about the imagination as the faculty that produces images of things that aren't there and that doesn't sound very positive but I have a positive view of the imagination I think it's a it's a cognitive faculty that is, it can help us get at the truth. And here's how I see it. Um, analysis is reason in its mode where it's taking things apart. But imagination is, is reason doing synthesis. That is, reason finding patterns, making connections, seeing the big picture. Okay, so I see imagination as the ability to fit parts into the whole, to see a meaningful pattern. And with that understanding of the imagination, then, I would say a biblically disciplined imagination is one that is able to see the parts even of our lives in terms of the whole story of the Bible. And that's what we need, you see. We need, to, again, to be the kind of Christians, not who simply read the Bible and then aren't sure what to do about it, but we need to be the kind of people who read the Bible and then see the rest of the world and our lives by Scripture's light. That's, a biblical, that's what I mean by a biblically disciplined imagination, to make sure that the way we're interpreting things is according to the scriptures. By contrast, a non-disciplined imagination or a non-biblically disciplined imagination is one that tries to understand this experience and maybe even Christianity and the church from uh, a, a non-biblical text, from some other picture. <laughs> That's uh, really helpful, I think, um, to understand that uh, we're not just reading our Bibles to take in information, um, but, to, but to see life through the grid of, of the Bible and then to, to, uh, to live from that grid. Grid, uh, for our lives. Yeah, and uh, I think, I, I don't think I'm inventing something new here. I think I'm retrieving something. I think this is partly what Calvin meant with his famous phrase when he likens scripture to the spectacles of faith. He's referring to eyeglasses, right? And so he's saying that when we are reading scripture, we're seeing the world through the spectacles of faith, through the lenses of faith. And that's why we need to discipline our imagination.
imagination and sympathy. Yeah, that's really helpful. In what way is biblical interpretation like a theatrical performance? Okay, well, so I've spent uh, a lot of time exploring this connection, interpretation as performance, and I think there are several reasons for this. So let me, I think I can mention three reasons, maybe even four, but one reason stems again from the title of my book, Hearers and Doers. Jesus doesn't want people simply to hear his word, he wants people to hear it and do it. What is doing a word if not performing it? So theatrical performance is doing words, right? A, a playwright writes a script and then the players do it. They perform it. That is, the performance is their interpretation. And uh, I think I also got on to this because, as I said earlier, I'm a pianist. And when, when, I, when I play the piano, I, I use scores, I use musical texts. When I play the piano, I'm interpreting the text, but I'm also performing it. In other words, my performance is my interpretation, and this is exactly how I see the life of the Christian. The way a person lives as a Christian is his or her interpretation of the Bible. In other words, if our lives are a performance of what we believe, then our lives are the most important form our interpretation takes. And again, um, I do think there are biblical precedents for this way of thinking. I've already mentioned Jesus' words, you know, he he who hears and does my words is a wise man. He he who hears but does not do my word is like the man who builds a house on the on the sand. It's going to be washed away. We have to put God's word into practice. And one other biblical precedent from the Old Testament, remember those prophets like Ezekiel who did, did weird things? <laughs> God told them, you know, Ezekiel to uh, put a brick down and write Jerusalem's name on it and then put deeds works to it. There he was supposed to create a little model that was attacking Jerusalem, this brick. Well, that that actually is a kind of open air performance. You know, he's doing he's doing theater with bricks, <laughs> interactive theater to try to communicate God's word. So I, I do think there are biblical precedents for this idea, but but even if there weren't, I'm still convinced that in many cases the way we live, our performance is our interpretation. Because it's one thing to say something, it's another to do it. And what God wants are people who lead, uh, who actually live Christian lives, not simply people who talk about it. That's performance and living it out. I, I really like that. Um, what's interesting is in Ephesians 4.1, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In Colossians 1.10, it says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. In Philippians 1.27, Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come to you and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. You know, so just to strengthen your point even further, you know, there is a, there is a, because we believe, then you're supposed to walk in that manner. So, so yeah. your point, your point is, uh, is, is, is a powerful one. Yeah, I think it's throughout Paul's epistles, the, you know, the first chapters of a letter from Paul often are big on the indicatives. There these are the statements of what is the case in Christ. And then there's often a hinge where Paul says, therefore, and then he moves into the imperative mood, which is about doing. So first, here's the case of what is in Christ, therefore, do this. And I think it's basically Paul is saying, here's what you are in Christ. Now, go out and act like it. <laughs> you know, perform your life in Christ. Perform Christ. In fact, Paul actually has a phrase, put on Christ. Clothe yourself with Christ. We might even say perform Christ. Mm, but that's really good, really good. What advice would you have for the pastor who not only desires to be a good pastor theologian, but an eye doctor and a general practitioner of the church, but, but they're maybe not sure uh, where to begin with these ideas? So, yeah, important question, because as I was saying earlier, you know, the picture of what a pastor is has changed over the years. You can, there are actually books written about this. You can chart the idea that that the pastor is mainly a master of material, right? We have these degrees, master of divinity. So in the 19th century, the pastor was the person who knew more than anybody else in his small town. And then you had a, a stage where the pastor was a builder of new churches. And then in the 20th century, the idea that the pastor is a manager and a therapist and an entertainer came to the fore. And I, these are images that really encourage you to minister in a particular direction. And this is particularly 
particularly helpful in my opinion. A, ma- a pastor has to do more than manage people. He has to minister the word of God. And this is why I look at the pastor as a generalist, someone who's able to minister the word of God in many ways and in many different situations. Um, but the pastor is a special kind of generalist. I would say the pastor is someone who can talk about just about anything. That's the generalist part. But he talks about just about anything in light of one particular thing, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I see the pastor as a special kind of generalist or a general specialist, that is someone who's able to relate everything to the gospel. But you asked that, how does someone learn how to do that? And there are some good resources out there now. Uh, A few years back, I co-authored a book with Owen Strand called The Pastor as Public Theologian. And the idea is that the pastor is a theologian ministering God's word, but unlike an academic theologian, the pastor works with people. So that's the term public theologian. And that uh, same year that we wrote that book, Todd Wilson and Gerald Heaston wrote a book called The Pastor Theologian. It's uh, Both books are complementary. They're doing much the same thing. But Todd and Gerald, they're founders of something called the Center for Pastor Theologians. So I would encourage any pastor who wants to be encouraged to, in this direction to have a look at their website. Um, I think it's simply www.pastortheologians.com. And if you go to that website, you'll see that there's an annual theology conference it takes place in Oak Park, Illinois, every year. And the conference papers are published as books, usually by InterVarsity Press. And then they also have a bulletin of ecclesial theology, where you see how pastors are doing theology in the church for the church. So I would have a, you know, I'd recommend that people have a look at those resources. Yeah, we'll definitely put that in the show notes, and I and I appreciate the the, the work they're doing for sure. Well, Good. Dr. Van Hooser, uh, there's a there's a lot that we could you know talk about about this this subject as a whole, and I know you have a lot of, of thoughts uh, about it. But uh, just as we wrap up this conversation, can you give us a few takeaways that you would want for our listeners? Um, let me let me give you one big takeaway, something that I think should um, you know govern or discipline the imagination of pastors, and it comes from Scripture. It's a story we've read uh, many times, but I want to apply it in a special way to pastors. You, you remember in Luke two, the, Jesus' parents are frantically looking for him because they've lost him. He's a twelve-year-old boy. They've lost their boy. I think that that is a terrible feeling, and they eventually find him. Uh, and and he's in the temple. And when they find him in the temple, they're kind of, you know, stunned. And, you know, why, why didn't you tell us where you were? And Jesus looks at them and he says, you know, I don't understand why you're so surprised. Didn't you know I'd have to be about my father's business? Now, there's an interesting picture for a pastor, a businessman, <laughs> someone who goes about the father's business. And I think a better translation of that phrase would be, uh, didn't you know I had to be about the things of my father, the things of my father. So whether you think it in that phrase, or my father's business, or even in my father's house, which is another possible translation of that passage, the point is, Jesus was about his father's activity. And I think this should encourage pastors, because pastors are also in the father's house, uh, involved in the things of the father, about the father's business. And what is that business? What is the father up to? I said it earlier on. The father's business is making a people for himself, a holy nation to be his treasured possession. And I'd like to just take away the leave away, (laughs) the giveaway, is the picture of the pastor as in the house of God about the Father's business. It's a very theological vocation. The pastor's there in the church to form people into a holy nation, people who will be faithful uh, to God and obedient to God. And when they are faithful and obedient to God, they will be an amazing and a compelling parable of the kingdom to the communities that are around them. That's uh, really, really, really well said. Well, Dr. Van Hooser, I really have enjoyed this conversation and the time that you've given to me and to our listeners, and just want to thank you for your your great work that you're doing, and uh, please keep it up for the the glory of our Savior. Well, thank you, Dave. I enjoyed the conversation, and and thanks for that encouraging parting word. Bye-bye. I'd like to thank Lexum Press for sponsoring today's episode. Don't forget to visit the Lexum Press website at Lexum Press.com slash Van Hooser to receive 30% off of Kevin Van Hooser's book, Hearers and Doers. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you were encouraged by today's episode. 
Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. For more uplifting and thought-provoking content, please visit us online at servantsofgrace.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Servants of Grace and on Facebook at facebook.com slash servants of grace. We hope you have a blessed day and we will see you next time.